Hello and welcome to the Can't Pause This podcast. My name is Marcus Wood and today you'll be listening to a conversation I recently had with comic book writer Ryan O'Sullivan. Ryan's written graphic novels such as Turncoat, Eisenhorn and, and why we're here, he's a writer on the soon to be released Warhammer 40,000 comic series. I managed to catch up with Ryan where we discussed how he got his start in comics, the brand new Warhammer 40,000 series and what he's reading at the moment. Hope you enjoy it, and if you do, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, a subscribe, all that good stuff. Here we go. Ryan, so, um, I'm going to start naturally from the beginning. Uh, How did you get into comics? Uh, Was there any particular memory or whatever else that kind of brought you into it? You mean like growing up, that sort of thing? Yeah, and what kind of made you want to do it for a living, really? Um, The first comic I read that I can recall... Um, other than the Beano and the Dandy and whatnot, which sort of all blur together into one big sort of childhood event, was um, one of the X-Men comics that were like A4 size, because if you remember Panini, I think they used to sell them in the newsagents. Okay, and yeah. uh, it was like a bigger than usual one, so I thought it meant it was a really special one. And I read that cover to cover so many times. I mean, it was part three of a four-part miniseries. I had no idea as a kid. I just assumed all comics were like this and didn't make any sense. And that was amazing. So I had to like invent... I mean, I can't remember who wrote it, but they did the best to sort of make make it a self-contained story like you do. But I remember thinking at the time that that sort of the purpose of comics was to engage with it and try and create a world around the thing I was was reading. It was X-Men as well, so yeah, that was pretty funky. Um, In terms of why I sort of decided to get into it, uh, I think it's one of... I think... I don't know. Why do any of us do what we do? But I remember I read or heard something by Terry Pratchett once who said that Writers are just people who've read so much that it's spilled over into, you know, they they read so much they have to, they never to be, end up becoming writers. I think that's the case with me. Um, I don't really. I tried other stuff, you know. I tried, you know, proper jobs, and it just didn't work. So <laughs> I had to make stuff up for a living instead. It's not a bad, not a bad way to earn a living. It's all right. It's uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't really have much for. It's almost like that question you get asked when people say, where do your ideas come from? And just does. <laughs> they just do. Yeah. Why do you want to write? It's like, well, this kind of, I don't say the only thing I'm good at. That makes it sound like, a, you know, I'll just pick the worst thing to do. But it's not, no, it's more a case of just. I remember those Panini, like some of those UK editions of stuff. So mm. uh, you would have had to have filled in a lot of blanks there. So by the time you were done with that, yeah. you'd probably got right at halfway anyway. Well, yeah, I went back and read it recently, and it had about four or five different plot lines all threading through it. It was really well done. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to look back at the nineties and think that all the sort of, you know, the popular comics were just sort of, sort of over the top extreme, but it was that well put together. So that's uh yeah, I can't I think it was one that had um, a Legion in it. Professor X's son. Like Professor X, obviously, as a kid, I was watching the cartoon where Professor X was in a wheelchair. And then in the comic, he was walking around, and I thought, this is amazing. None of the, literally, none of this makes any sense to me as a kid. So I, uh, I love that. That yeah. animated series, that, that was my like intro to superheroes and comics. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible. Everyone was super ripped, even Professor X. I, I just As a kid, I was like, cool, body dysmorphia, this in wrestling, let's go. Like, it, was, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was great. That and Spider-Man as well. Yeah, it was... Um... I think it was called Amazing. I think it was just literally Spider Man, the, co- the cartoon. But that was like perfect intro because it was all like the classic comic storylines, but in like these weird bite sized. When you go back over it later on, yeah. they were massive arcs in the comics, whereas they were kind of done into like bite sized chunks in the cartoon. Yeah, and they all changed as well because there's some things that couldn't. They couldn't show kids. Like Morbius couldn't drink blood, so he had to drink plasma. Oh, yeah. But that was still from people's bloodstream, so I don't really get the difference. But no guns it was, either. It was no lasers, guns. Yeah, is... it's like the turtles; they couldn't use their weapons to hurt people. They had to just like chop up robots or throw pizzas at the bad guys or, or something. They were totally intimidation based. Inventive, because you didn't notice that as a kid. As a kid, you didn't notice that. So no, even even the fact the tank had a laser cannon on it didn't like absolutely nothing to take me out of it. So that was pretty impressive. Yeah. True, man. How about yourself? What was your first? sort of comic that got you into reading them um bizarrely it probably was like that that those cartoons and then it was a case of 
oh okay this is like other stuff um yeah so then i kind of got latched on to it probably was like the x-men it was those like you get these annuals so oh, like, yeah, they're just weird like barely even whole storylines like just parts <laughs> of uh so i got like a, a spider-man one for christmas and then it kind of snowballed a little bit until i hit like kept hearing that this one called Watchmen was like the greatest thing ever. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll check it out. And then it was just blown away. And after that, it was just, yeah, mainlining comics, really. I think Watchmen's one of those sort of entry points for a lot of people into sort of crossing over from it being something they read as kids to being, oh, actually, I can read this as an adult. Even though when you first read Watchmen, you just read it as a sort of surface level uh, adventure story and you think it's pretty cool. But as, when you go back and read it again, when, you, when you're older, I suppose, you sort of find the, the sort of hidden depths to it. Yeah, I mean, it's you. I kind of found you had to, like, rack it, to get the maximum out of it. It was good to have racked up some mileage with comics, because it's a critique on superheroes, it's a critique on a lot of different stuff. But you won't necessarily get that unless you've read the thing it's critiquing. Yeah, like, you'll read it and think that Rorschach's a badass, rather than think he's mocking all those over-the-top vigilantes who... You know, crazy violent and all the rest. Yeah, and go and read some Superman before you like, and then when you come back to Doctor Manhattan, it's like, oh, he's just an overpowered, you know, the typical yeah. uh, kind of boring, overpowered superhero. Yeah, I think that Buzzix Marvels was another one as well, because that was done from the perspective of um, sort of guy on the street, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, as a kid. yeah. yeah. Um, so. The thing that's kind of got us here this week is mm-hmm. Warhammer 40,000's coming out. Yes. Which you happen to be the writer of. Yeah, I'm the writer of Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War, issue one. So, can you give us, without obviously spoiling anything, uh, can you give us a little gist of kind of uh, what to expect, what's going to what's going on with uh, your run sure. on Warhammer? I mean, it's a four-issue mini, and it's based around the video game Dawn of War 3 that's just come out. But the story itself is self-contained, so you can just read the comic without having to play the game. But I suggest you get the game because, you know, plug, 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 it's good. <laughs> um, the actual comic itself, it's about, um, for those not familiar with Warhammer, there's a group of sort of uh, space, I suppose you call them. Hmm. It's, it's a sci-fi setting, and it has sort of fantasy principles. So even though everyone's got spaceships and guns, half the time people are using sort of Thor-esque hammers to beat the crap out of each other. And swords that can fire, look at that lot have sort of lightning shooting out of them. So it's it's all the good stuff from fantasy and sci-fi all sort of melded into one pot. And this comic follows a group of space marines who are the sort of the sort of steroidal stormtroopers, but good. Uh, and they have lost their lead. What well, their leader, Gabriel Angelos, he's sort of gone missing on a planet. So the space marines assemble sort of a cracked team of all his sort of the sort of best they have at what they do and send them down in a drop pod to this planet to try and uh to try and rescue Gabriel from the sort of various alien forces that are there. Um sort of I don't want to say too much more because then we'll no, start no. getting into the actual story. But it's it's sort of one of those things like, you know, the boss of this group of space marines was captured, so they sent their elite to go and rescue him. And what was quite nice about this was that um Dawn of War is it the third game to come out, but obviously there's been two games prior, and those games have got an ongoing narrative, and what I was able to do with the comics, with some of the characters from the prior games that didn't make it into the new game, such as Tarkus or Martellus, people like that, I was able to put show them in the comics. I was able to carry on some of the story from the prior game that the uh, the current game isn't doing, which is kind of cool, because yeah. I'm a fan of the games myself. Well, I was going to ask, uh, was it was it good sort of playing with another franchise, you know, because it's a, not an original franchise? Mm. Was it weird? Was it a good thing? Was it a bit of a drawback kind of playing with something else that was so established and already had its own? Oh, you mean as opposed to say something I made up myself? Yeah. Uh, well, there's... I mean, there's downsides to, to comics. Um, I mean, fortunately, Warhammer is something I was really into growing up, uh, the models, collecting them. Um, sort of fell out of love with it as I got older. And then fell back into it in my, my 20s, sort of rediscovering the novels that came out. So they've got a huge chain of novels for, for the Black Library. And I sort of devoured my way through loads of them. 
Uh, so when it came, so when Titan said, you know, are you interested? That's the publisher of the, the comic. When Titan said, are you interested in um, working on this? I was like, hell yeah, this is this is a, 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 um, it's an it's sort of a licensed work that I really like. It wasn't like they were saying, hey, is this a license? Try and find it interesting to do. They were like, no, this is it was something I really enjoy. So, um, so there was there wasn't a case that I was sort of working on something I don't like because I need the cash because I'd never do that. It was something I've got a lot of interest for and interest in. Um, but in terms of Games Workshop, they're very, very sort of, they've got a very dedicated, hardcore fan base. So everything has to be just right. So um, that obviously means that when it comes to the script, lots of people have to see it. When it comes to the art, similar similar thing there. Um, but it's good because it means that ultimately the comic ends up looking absolutely fantastic. Like Daniel Indro and Kevin Enhart, the, the, the pencilist, inker and the colorist on this, They've done a phenomenal job with the art, and it all looks legitimately like just Dawn of the, the Warhammer figurines, which is wow. sort of the main thing that a lot of a lot of criticisms towards, um, or the criticisms that the Warhammer fans could have is, oh, it doesn't look anything like because you know they're, they're hardcore fans, they'll sort of, they see a weakness, they'll jump on it, they'll look, they're out for blood. But no, I think they're going to enjoy this one uh, because we've made a real real effort to engage with why they like it. Because a lot of the time when you're doing work for high comics. Um, it could be very easy to just sort of do a a genre story, not really engage with the subject matter, just Wikipedia it a bit. But you know, as I'm into it myself, I could dive really into it and look at what it is that makes others like it too, and really try and sort of write a comic for them. Whereas if it's a comic that I'm making up, that I'm sort of putting out through a creator own publisher, that'd be almost more a comic for me. I'd write a comic that I'd like to see on the shelf. Whereas with something like this, like with Dawn of War, I'm writing a comic that, well, I would like to see on the shelf, but that I know it's specifically for other people. It's not for me. Does that make any sense? Or am I just sort of waffling away? No, no, I on think... On a cloud here. No, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think with you being actually a fan of it, it's going to be way easier and you, you're going to be able to get the soul of what, you know, Warhammer 40,000 is to actually kind of get what why people like that franchise while also bring in like a new kind of voice and a new creative element to it as opposed mm-hmm. to if you weren't into it kind of splashing a warhammer title over it and then making your own thing completely you're yeah, actually kind of you, striking yeah. that too because yeah, you see those those sorts of comics all the time you know, someone gets hired to do a, a comic based on i don't know a video game or a superhero or something like that and then they clearly just tell us a really easy story that could be anyone you know but but i think that the best stories are when you really engage with what it is that makes the character tick, or the the the, the the license tick you know what makes the fans like it i remember for dawn of war i actually went and researched you know 4chan 1d4 chan reddit all the sort of depths of the internet because i find that when you're looking at licensed stuff you can do all the research you can be a fan of it yourself but unless you really know what the sort of internet hive of mind thinks of something hmm. You don't, you don't really engage with it. You've got to see the memes built up around this thing to really understand the sensibilities of the people that like it. Um, don't be one of those people that puts the memes in the comic because then you're sort of trying, trying to be cool and just, uh, just absolutely failing at it. Uh, but you should definitely look at them and see, like, okay, why are certain things, where did this meme come from? Why do people, you know, what is it that makes people respond to this thing a certain way? And then you can backwards sort of build towards how you should approach the comic. Obviously, don't make it a meme, but you know you should sort of understand the the sort of start. I don't, know, I don't want to say three sixty view because that's a sort of lame bullshit uh, business term. <laughs> but uh, yeah, essentially, you need that to understand how to put something like this together. I think anyway, that's just my approach. Obviously, there's no rules to this. Yeah, but I think that's it. Sounds like a good way of, like, say, actually having a bit of a soul to it rather than yeah. something that's just got the right colours painted on it. You know. <laughs> yeah, it does have the right colours painted on it. Kevin did a really good job filming. It's absolutely amazing. True. There's one sequence at the start of the first issue, not giving any spoilers away, where there's sort of three scenes happening at once and they all converge on each other and it's entirely dependent on the following. And he blew, he blew me away. It was amazing. Nice. What was the... Because obviously it is total like sci-fi and, and action. Um, yeah. Were there anything like any influences outside of Warhammer that you kind of played into your writing of this um yeah i mean 
there's a lot of fighting in it. And I'm a fan of choreographed fight scenes in comics. You know, when I when I write a script, I don't like to say this panel, the fight. Panel two, still fighting. Panel three, still fighting. I like to sort of break it down and sort of try and control the action a bit. Half the time, the artist will ignore me and do something better. But I like to, I like to sort of try and say, okay, this because this sword's gone here. This is the position they're in. Then he just, you know, this and this and this. And the way I sort of figured that out, it was from uh, a tiny bit of Jackie Chan's films. Not really, though. Mainly, it was from um, lots of silent comics that I read. So I tend to veer towards silent comics. So I think, I think there's some issues of Moonlight. Moon Knight that Declan Shelby did, the silent one where he's sort of going in the massive tenement block. I think that was issue seven or something. So when you say silent, like completely without dialogue, that's... that's oh, well, not, not, not completely. I mean, I think there might be the occasion of like, ah, fuck, when someone gets punched in the <laughs> face. But no, mostly, mostly silent. I think the job of a writer sometimes is to just get out of the way and let the art tell the story. Not all the time, obviously, but sometimes. Um, and I definitely err towards that. Because my earlier stuff was sort of one page, nine panels. Each panel had two caption boxes. It's sort of like, I know I'm a comic writer, but look, look how literary I am. And I think I've calmed down since then. And I'm thinking, okay, now it's maybe you know, people buy comics because because of the art, I'd say, more so than the writing. Um, nah, nah, that's not true at all. It's because of both. But yeah, I, I do I do tend to draw inspiration from other artists when it comes to uh, fight scene heavy stuff. Um, I'm also a huge reader of manga, and that is obviously massively, massively decompressed compared to uh, a lot of American and UK comics. You know, lots is very, very slowly paced. Mm. And, and if you read a lot of that, it helps you to build up a sensibility of how to write a fight scene because you're used to slow pace, so you can see individual elements moving. Um, whereas if you, all you're reading is western comics then um you're maybe not going to develop those sensibilities uh i don't really one thing i'm not really influenced by is tv or film uh, other than jackie chan for some reason um i'm not really influenced by um those things which kind so of because makes... I, mean, I just can't i can't when i watch it i just my brain just switches off and i'm just engaged with it whereas with comics if i read a comic you know, I'm switched on. I'm analysing it all. I'm an incredibly slow reader because I just can't turn that off. When it comes to TV, people will see stuff, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's cool. I didn't notice that because I'm just a bit off my vegetable, I guess. I don't know." I think, like, well, like especially like American, which half what we get in Britain is like American TV. Yeah. But it's like so much from what you've just said. Like that is American TV is so fast moving, like both plot wise and like visually. Yeah, it just like you're in there and it's like go 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 go. Whereas like, like say cop well comics manga, it's all it lets everything breathe and it can in comparison seem a bit slow. Yeah, completely. I mean, the one one show I do quite like is Twenty Four, and that's really really fast paced. So I might have just contradicted myself completely by saying that. But yeah, I mean, I suppose because it's so tightly plotted. Because obviously they've got the silent clock and it's all happening in real time allegedly. Um, I think it's shot it's shot in scenes, but yeah. But I think um, yeah, I think Twenty Four is a good show. Um, I don't know if it influences me, but yeah, I mean, there's this. One, I mean, Will Eisner said that um, I'm sort of bouncing over here. Apologies for this. Hopefully, it'll sound somewhat legible, legible, audible in um, when people are listening. But yeah, Will Eisner said that comics were slightly more um, sort of drama or theatre. Than, the, than they were uh, film or TV based. And I think I'd agree with that because um, it's all about sort of you've a single shot of a character and they've got to over exaggerate in order to communicate to a reader in the same way someone on stage has to sort of over exaggerate their gestures so that people at the back can see. Whereas with TV, it's all quick cuts, small movements because the cameras are super close. And I don't think that's quite using comics to their full potential if you're having lots of still characters where that's just going to force people to focus on the dialogue and i think that's not really sorry the point of comics it's, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's, it's not really the point of comics um i think i think as a whole kind of focused a bit too much towards that at the moment um i'll say comics i don't mean comics as a whole mm -hmm. leave that with me we'll come back to that hopefully i'll have my figure out by then you just um saying that though. I'm kind of late to the party though. But on uh, I've been watching Attack on Titan. Attack, yeah. Yeah. Of like the anime. 
Mm-hmm. And that is like probably one of the best kind of translations of the manga in like visually because like you were saying they over comics and mangas have over exaggerate things well, the anime mm-hmm. kind of does it as well where it, like we'll watch a character and like they have like in a monologue and it goes yeah. on for quite a lot i mean it can if you're not used to that style of storytelling it can almost feel like painfully sl- slow but it makes mm-hmm. everything matter yeah, because everything is so extreme, especially in anime and manga. Um, they they really try and put as much emotion into things as possible, mm. and that's what I was, that's what I was saying about how a lot of Western comics have quite still characters, so that you focus on the dialogue. Whereas with manga, characters will be well, they'll be still, but you'll also have characters that, are, when they move, they really move, and I think that's that's a sensibility that. Um, Daniel Indro, the artist on Dawn of War, he really likes dynamic pages. Uh, so some of the, the things he's got characters doing, are just sort of leaping out of panels and stuff, which, which I'm not usually a huge fan of, but he's done it really well. So I'll just hats off to him. There's nothing, there's nothing better for a um, a writer than to have someone take your script and make it into a comic and improve so much of it. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Nice. Um. So moving, I'm not going to make you talk anymore about Warhammer because I'm going to start getting plot details from you. So I'll leave that alone. <laughs> I could go. I could go on for, for days on Warhammer. Probably best to move on. Um, anyone who hasn't re- sort of not familiar with your work though, uh, previous one was or one of the more well known was Turncoat. Yes. Um, can you just, again for people not particularly familiar? Um, do you want to give us a quick rundown of that? Um. Just to explain yeah, sure. that a little bit. Tunko was a graphic novel, well, it was a webcomic originally that I started with an artist called Play Klaus from America back in, I think, 2014 or 2015. One of those years, it's all blurred together. And it was about a chap called Duke, who was a professional assassin. And he his targets were always superheroes, uh, but never the, the cool ones, always the loser superheroes. The idea was that his job is to sort of keep the population of superheroes under control. Um, but the problem was that as much as he was an assassin of superheroes, his ex-wife was as well, and she was a lot better than him. So she was constantly stealing all his hits away from him. So the story is all about him desperately trying to get over his ex-wife and failing to because she's still massively in his life. Um, this isn't a sort of polemic book I was writing about an ex, I promise. It was literally just some reason the first, the first uh, not the first, but one of the first ideas I came up with and, and Klaus really seemed to like it, so he, he went with it. And yeah, I mean, that was a book that we we did as a webcomic for about six months, I think. And the response we got online was great. You know, we went with viral on Reddit, which was unexpected. And um, well, sort of, I'll say viral, not, you know, there weren't millions of people reading it. We got like a thousand people reading it in a day, and that's sort of micro viral. But yeah, it was cool to see that it had a um, that an idea that I came up with in my head. People responded well to it. It was the first time I'd sort of encountered that in terms of publicly my writing because you grow up and your schoolmates and your teachers and whatnot tell you that you're a good writer but the only time it actually seems true is when complete strangers say it you know there's always that worry that am i actually shit am i just was i just good compared to the 30 people i grew up with as opposed to actually you know the, the wider but yeah the school's still out on that but um but yeah that was kick-started i think yeah it was kick-started last year because after the webcomic due to the close um bunch of people said they wanted to take wanted a copy to have to own i didn't get that because you know they've read it why would they want it but hey i did it weeks like we did it and um yeah the response was phenomenal we got well i'm not gonna say how much we raised i think that's sort of, sort of bragging about numbers and stuff is a bit tacky but i will brag that we had about 800 people back it so i was very happy about that because um it was very very touching and uh found an audience in quite a it did good, yeah a good yeah. And what was interesting was the people that backed it weren't the people that I thought would. It wasn't, say, my friends and family. It was complete strangers. Um, I, there were people on Facebook, people off Twitter, but the vast majority of people that backed the book were people I didn't know. And this made me realise that your, your friends and your family aren't really your audience for your books. It's it's essentially complete strangers. And that's um, that's equal part, you know, heart warming. Because uh, strangers don't owe you anything. No, and they will be brutally honest as well. Yeah, they will. And they'll <laughs> at you with their brutal honesty on Twitter. <laughs> Do you, like, with when after Warhammer's been out for a little while and with, um, like, reactions to Turncoat, do you, like, really kind of 
seek out reviews and do you read all that kind of stuff or do you just once something's out you you let it sit and what's happened's happened well because i'm still quite at the early stages of my writing career um, i've only been doing this i've been writing for absolute bloody ages but i've only been sort of professionally writing for about a year and a half two years i don't know i'm still at the early stages of my writing career i've got to search out all the reviews and see what people think um it's not because i'm going to particularly take on board what they say but you have to read it you know it might crush your heart to think that you know your, your hilarious page full of sort of joss whedon s witticisms is just utter <laughs> try hard nerd humor but then someone else might adore it but the point is to read as much as you can about your work because ultimately even the people that are slaying it they're taking time out of their day to talk about your work that's doing you a favor really and if they're Very slaying fine. it, they're, they're going to be the sort of people that will give you super honest feedback. But then sometimes they'll be the sort of people that just like slaying stuff online. So you've got to you've got to take it all with a grain of salt, the good and the bad, hmm. uh, especially the good. Do not agree with people that say you're good because um, that won't you know, make you complacent. And that's the last thing I want to be. But yeah, you have to look at such chat reviews of your work. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that I've got a bunch of people who like reviewing my stuff. Uh, I say like they 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 review my stuff. Whether they like it, I don't know. But they're happy to review it. So I'm always able to sort of when I've got something new coming out, I just ping it out to uh, sort of my my mailing list of people, and they tend to respond quite well to it, which is nice. You know, because I started out doing Turncoat, which was a, a web comic that no one really heard of. Then I've done uh, did Eisenhorn for um, a video game company. Uh, Eisenhorn was a Warhammer comic. That was actually my first one, and because of that, sort of Titan noticed me and. I gave me some more Warhammer stuff, but I know I've got a whole bunch more things coming that I'm all NDA'd up on and can't talk about as a consequence of that. So it's all snowballing. So I think, you know, if, if my, the momentum's going well, I sort of, it's important for me to keep a level head and and see how people are responding to the work because you never know. Occasionally I'll read something on, like, Goodreads, which is a, a website notorious for just slaying your work. Because you know, if you've joined a website, if you're a member of Goodreads, then you've joined a website because you like reviewing stuff. So you're going to be the sort of person usually who just destroys books because you know you consider yourself to be an authority. You join the website, you rank stuff. Mm. So yeah, I get some horrendous things on there, but some of them are the best feedback I've ever had. So like I said, you just got to be humble. You got to realize that it doesn't matter what people think. Because you've written it, it's done. Like you're doing something else now. You're moving on to the next book. Yeah, cool. Man. Um, one last or uh, one more kind of comics question. Um, yeah, man. What do you, as far as other people's kind of stuff, and it can be like you know major stuff right down to the indie. Are like, are you reading anything at the moment? You've been way too busy Ooh. with your own. Or... I'm reading loads of stuff, but um, one thing. Well, okay. Uh, one thing I mentioned before I go into what I'm reading is that I've started, as of today actually, well actually I don't know if it's today, I don't know when this podcast is going out, as of the 15th of May, um, I've started a sort of little writing collective with some buddies of mine, Ram V, uh, Alex Packnadal and Dan Waters, we've all sort of got together and figured out that we all sort of have the same interest in comics, we all like comics that are quite challenging, uh, that sort of test the reader, uh, so we sort of banded together and we're doing a little newsletter all about sort of our, our approach to comics, stuff we've got coming out uh, and all that. It's called White Noise. So if you want to check it out, it's on my, my Twitter. So no, that's usually, the reason I'm mentioning it now is because that's usually where I put up a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm into, what I'm reading and, and things like that. But to actually answer your question, what I'm reading at the moment, um, I'm reading a lot of, because I'm working on a horror comic. I'm reading a lot of Junjo Ito. He's a, a manga uh, artist, writer, mangaka who uh, he's sort of like the godfather of horror over there because he's done. he did a book called Uzumaki that I'm reading through at the moment, and he also did a book called Goyo that I've, I went through. And Goyo has the most ridiculous concept, but it is absolutely terrifying. The concept is, what if fish had legs? I mean, <laughs> that is, that, I'm, I'm not doing it, uh, I'm giving it a bit of a disservice there, but it is genuinely terrifying. Um, and... I've always prided myself on, you know, I watch horror films and all that, but comics have never scared me. I've never actually been terrified by a comic. Occasionally I'll turn the page and an Alan Moore comic and I'll have something jump. Other than that, I've never actually been scared. Reading Jojo Ito made me realise that comics can be absolutely terrifying. Uh, it's just the, the the way he puts it together is just so brilliant. It starts out with a character sort of 
trying to find a monster, let's say, and he can't find it, and the monster's there, so the fear is the unknown. Then when he sees the monster, the fear becomes this physical creature that's chasing him, and then it just every time the sort of the thing that's scary gets revealed, because obviously once something's revealed, it can't be scary anymore. Junji Ito finds a new way to make it scary. <laughs> it's just it's very very aspirational reading as well as research for the thing I'm working on. So yeah, Junji Ito, I'm enjoying. Um, I'm enjoying. I read Tom King's Vision recently. That was great. Everyone's going on about that. Read Mark Russell's Flintstones of all things. That was brilliant. Um, that's something DC's doing at the moment. Uh, in terms of indie stuff, I've read a whole bunch of stuff by a dude called Stuart John McCune. I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, but he's done. Um, he did a series called Monologue. That was just. It's just amazing. Every now and again, when you're in comics, every now and again you'll find an indie writer. And you'll, see, you'll read their interviews first, usually, because you'll just be curious about who they are. And they'll say all these things about how they're influenced by literature, philosophy, they want to do this for comics, they want to change the world in comics, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I heard it before. And then you read their work, and it's just not to scratch. Stuart said all that stuff, read his work, I was blown away. It was absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, so it's called Monologue, and his name again is uh, Stuart John McCune, and... Yeah, anyone listening, go check it out. Some of the best comics I've read all year. Really, really good. Wow, okay. How about yourself? Are you reading anything uh, comic-y at the moment? Um, I'm just mainly... I haven't started anything new. Um, I've always been into... Do you know uh, Sex Criminals from Image? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, yeah. I'm Satisfaction, Chipsarski. Yeah, it's... As much as I try and convince people, it's like, it is more than smart. Um, Yeah, I've just always been into that. I think I still love the humour visually. Just stuff like... Because I read the um, first um, first volume of that, and I liked it, because, as I said, I thought it was going to be just pure sex, but it just became really daft humour, and actually quite touching as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the characters are really well... I always try and zone in on, like, well-written, like, actual, kind of, well-rounded characters. Mm. But also, like, I'm not really... I always kind of prioritise... I think everyone does it their own way with comics, but I'm more mm. of a writing first, then art. But in sure. this case, it was things with Kashmir, like um, when uh, the couple, they, they have sex and orgasm and time yeah. stops. To signify that time stops, they kind of do this like cool Technicolor effect. Yeah, yeah. But straight away, I was like, oh, wow, I've never seen that before. I've never seen color used to communicate that the state of, you know, where they are has changed. And it's just stuff like that, the way after like years and years of, not that anything wrong with Marvel and DC, but then you kind of go outside the bubble and it's like, oh, wow, I've never seen that. You know, that's a new technique. Oh, that's something that you wouldn't maybe see in a normal superhero comic. Yeah, massively, because I think with, with a lot of the Marvel and DC stuff I grew up on, it had a sort of house style. Whereas mm. if you go for these sort of, I don't know if you can still call it image indie, because it's, it's, it's massive now. But if, 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 you, if you go sort of outside of that, you find a lot of alternative takes on how to put a comic together. I know Marvel and DC are doing are doing alternative stuff now, but I'm just saying compared to the stuff I, I read growing up, a lot of the, the image stuff now is uh I'll say all over the place, but that's a compliment. <laughs> it's got lots of different like ways of doing things. I and think Sex Criminals is great as well. I do I do enjoy that book. Yeah, DC and Marvel like as much as it it has definitely branched out, but you know if you pick one up you still pretty much if you've read comics before you know that you're reading like a DC book or a Marvel book. Just because that style is, there obviously is still some rules there because, like, art wise, yeah, it just it still seems quite familiar. Yeah, because they've got like fans who really like really want to assert it to be a comic to be put together a certain way, and you know, if you've got a huge bunch of fans saying make us a comic like this, you're not going to ignore them. So, yeah, the, there was that um the Marvel, oh, I, don't, I don't know if it was like their one of their chief executive officers of something or other. Yeah, uh, apparently his take on it was that like on declining sales was they've like diversified too much that having like because they've got like a female thor now and uh yeah yeah. um they've kind of spread that about and apparently it's become too diverse for the fans and it's just like yeah we're still in that same kind of mindset a little bit um well i I I don't really know enough about sort of marvel's inner workings to really comment on that but i do know that um i really enjoyed tom king's work and I mean that's not diverse in case in terms of like 
sort of inclusive of race and different sexualities. Although technically robots are a different race and different sexualities. You know what I mean? It's not sort of like a progressive comic at all with a capital yeah. P. But it but it is definitely diverse compared to the art style of other things they've done. So I don't know. I'm not I'm not entirely a hundred percent on what I think it was Axel Alonso said that. I'm not entirely sure what he was getting at with that. Um so I don't know how Marvel works internally. But uh I do still read their stuff. They put out books every year that I enjoy. So do DC. So I'm I'm happy. I keep I keep it very simple with comics because uh, when you work in comics and you see the strings, it's very easy to hate everything. Mm. It's like with anything. If if you worked in music, you'd end up hating most pop music. You know, you, I'll do anyway. But bad example. You know, if if you worked in books, you'd end up hating most contemporary literature. You, when you work in somewhere, you, you've you've got to sort of try not to lose the magic. So when it comes to these sort of online arguments i tend to just stay away from them i don't engage with either side really um, yeah, wise move yeah i mean it's wise for the career as well you know you don't want to be sort of <laughs> ranting and raving about you know xyz publisher and then they give you an email next week saying hey do you want to wait hang on never mind you're, you're an online uh yeah I heard... always, always best just to sort of focus on the good i think because there's enough people online ranting about bad shit especially at the moment with the sort of political situation everywhere i want i once heard that if you can't find anything good about something you're not trying hard enough and i try and live my um yeah. audience my audience life by that that if like there can't be a film or a book or whatever it is where it's just like everything about this is absolutely terrible there's always going to be there's <laughs> something you know i like you can find something good about it yeah because so. when there's something that is absolutely terrible in every aspect it becomes good like the room that movie with um what's his face tommy wizzo it was so so terrible that it got a cult following so it's all cycle. It all cycles back, you know. Yes, it'll find it. Somebody, somebody out there will like something. It usually, if I, if I read a comic and it's shit, I'll just sort of put it down and not ever talk about it again. I don't. Yeah, but that's me. I'm different. Well, I'm not different. Most people are like that. That's a that's a nice stress stress free way of doing things. I think. Yeah. Probably cool, doing it with two or three comics in a row. <laughs> <But> no, <laughs> it doesn't happen too often. Uh, I'm going to let you get away in a sec. But cool. first off, before you do go, uh, is there anything you want? The people listening, the folks at home, uh, is there anything you want them to be looking at of yours, of anybody else's, anything you want to kind of point uh, in the direction of? Yeah, I mean, if you want to go and check out my Twitter, it's at Ryan O'Sullivan, or one word. Um, that's got all my new stuff coming out. Uh, it's where I announce all the new stuff my friends are going out, because you know I'm a retweet fiend. Uh, me and Play Klaus, the guy who drew Turncoat, he, we're working on another book that's coming out later on in the year, so keep an eye out for that. And as I mentioned, me and a couple of my writer buddies are putting together a newsletter called White Noise. So if you want to keep on track with what I'm doing, that's probably the best place to check it out. Uh, other than that, I don't really have much to plug. Everything else is NDA'd up. So yeah, I'm good. Cool. Bye, bye, Dawn of War, please. <laughs> Again, it's out, the first one's this week? It's out Wednesday the 17th. So yeah, this week. Nice, a couple days. Okay. It's the 17th, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just checking it's the right day. I want people to show up at the comic shop without like nothing there. Okay, so you had the man go queue up, at, go queue outside the door of the comic shop Wednesday. Get out there. Indeed. Cool. So you might be listening to this podcast on our YouTube channel or SoundCloud. Uh, be up on both, so go listen to it on both maybe. If you're listening on YouTube and you've enjoyed this episode, please like the videos. It does help us out a lot. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes as well as other videos, including. Uh, Steve's Let's Plays, uh, reviews, general douchebaggery, really. We also have a ton of written content on can'tpausis.com. It includes reviews and commentary on all things movies, TV, gaming, and comics from a whole host of incredibly talented writers. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter, respectively. That's facebook.com slash can'tpausis. And at can'tpausis on Twitter, where Steve would love if you to put your memes for his dank collection but we'd all love to hear what you think of the first issue of the new warhammer 40k comics that we were talking to ryan about but anyway until next time thanks for listening guys catch you soon bye